praise the Lord. Glory to God. While you're standing, if you're standing, if you're not standing, if you could stand, we're going to take our text out of 1 Corinthians this morning, chapter 1. And when you get there, please say amen. It's good to see Sister Reed out and Tom back and Brother Al and Sister Darlene. Should I say Grandma and Grandpa? Good to have you here. Glad to see everyone else. All right, I'm going to read from verse 9, then we're going to skip and then go down to 17. Verse 9 says, God is faithful by whom ye were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind, in the same judgment. And then skipping down to 17, and I apologize for the length of reading. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, nor many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of this world and the things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Brother Don, will you pray for our service this morning? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I apologize for my voice. A lot of sinus stuff going on. But I'm going to do my best this morning to deliver a message I have titled, Skip the $10 Words. Skip the $10 Words. Our main text was 1 Corinthians, but I think it's important to understand some of the groundwork of Corinth. The city was basically a land bridge between northern Greece and lower Greece. It had ports on either side or bays. So you had a lot of merchants and stuff. However, looking back in 146 B.C., so 150 years before the birth of God, Rome declared war on what they called the Archaean League, a fancy term for a group of Greek cities. And so you think of Corinth as a bustling city. Well, in 146, it was flattened. It was crushed. Uh, Lucius Mamias entered the city, killed all the men, sold off all the women and children as slaves, and burnt the city down. It was desolate. And so we think of a lot of these ancient cities as being around for a long time. And it was around, but there was nothing. It was destitute. Until about 44 B.C., where Julius Caesar decided, hey, you know what, let's recolonize. Now, there's no exact number There's no record for how many people Rome sent to recolonize, but based upon other cities that were colonized, they expect somewhere between 1,500 and 3,000 people were sent from Rome to rebuild Corinth in 44 BC. Of those, you would have your merchants, you would have your retired military, and you had a lot of freedmen 
who were former slaves. Most people were looking to create a new life. Not exactly the, cre the cream of the crop necessarily. Not saying it's the worst people, I understand that. But people looking for something new aren't always satisfied with where they are. And some of them might not have had a choice about going to Corinth. So they were sent there in about 44 BC. So they would have carried the thinking of Rome with them. And we've been talking in our Sunday school class about Rome, about a lot of the philosophies and the thinking and the lifestyle of Rome, the lewdness, the lasciviousness, the impurity. And now you're reestablishing a city in Greece. And Greece has cities already. So you're going to have a lot of impact from the cities around you. Because the last thing you want to do when you're recolonizing as a small force with a burnt down city is to show up and start ruffling everybody's feathers. Because 1,500 people can disappear pretty quick. So you got to think, now they've had a lot, of the, a lot more of that Greek culture that was already prevalent through Rome has now been pushed into this group. And so by the time Paul has reached them, it is a true melting pot of cultures, economics, society, social structure. So the church was very diverse. Now, as Americans, we're kind of spoiled by that thinking, aren't we? We're used to being part of a melting pot. We're used to a bunch of different cultures. But that wasn't the case. It was, if you don't belong here, what are you doing here? Why are you here? This isn't your city. You don't belong. So having a melting pot city like that had a lot of interesting dynamics, potential conflicts. How many conflicts do we have when it's not for the desire of conflict? It's pure innocence in thinking of how we behave. We have people who are introvert. We have people who are extrovert. We have people who uh, just view things differently and may not mean offense, but offenses show up because of differences in how people are. And so you have the city of Corinth that was there. Now, Paul had been to Corinth in Acts 18, 9 to 11 has it, where Paul had, was in Corinth for about 18 months, and he establishes a church there. And the date of this letter is approximately three years later. Now, 1 Corinthians isn't the first letter to the Corinthians. It's the first letter that we have. Because in 1 Corinthians 5, 9, it says, I wrote unto you an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with covetous, or extortioners, or with idols. For then must ye needs go out of this world. But now I have written unto you to keep company, if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or a daughter, or rail, or a drunkard, or extortioner, or such as one not to eat. Paul had already written them once. He's written them a second time. He established them. There is a relationship that has already clearly been established between Paul and the church at this time. He's not reaching out to new people for the first time. He knows them. Matter of fact, this letter, and we skipped over the verse, but in verse 11 it says, For it hath been declared unto me, my brethren, by them which are the house of Cleo, that there are contentions among you. There was problems. Imagine that. Problems within a church. Contentions between church and the leadership that established it. So much so that verse 12 talked about some of the people saying, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I am of Cephas, and I am of Christ, and I am of this person, I am that, instead of I am part of the Lord Jesus Christ church. Right. You have people taking all different sides to saying whose authority they were going to be under. So much so that Paul's words would be considered absolutely scandalous by today's preachers. We'll go back, but he says, For Christ sent me not to baptize. 
don't know about you, but in some circles, that would start a riot. That's what we're there for. We're there to baptize, right? I, I'm not conveying the tone. I know I'm not. I don't have the excitement. I don't have the tone. Um, but for a minister who established a church to say, I am glad that I didn't baptize a lot of you, that is so telling. That's, that's harsh, thank you. That's brutal. How would you feel if our pastor comes to the pulpit and says, I am so thankful I didn't baptize any one of you? <laughs> that's hard to chew on. That's not good language. And I don't think that's because Paul didn't want to baptize people. But it's because of the, the contention, the strife, the animosity that was growing on. He says, it was, better, it was better that I didn't do good work so that you could turn it to evil contention among yourselves. But also, the first and foremost, the primary, the numero uno, whatever you want to call it, is the gospel is preached. And I know I'm you know, preaching to the choir here. It's fundamental that we understand who God is. Baptism is the remission of sins, the creation of relationship between us and other men and us and God. How can we have a, a correct relationship with God if we don't know who He is? It is impossible to understand what a right relationship would be unless we know who God is and what is expected in a right relationship. You can't have it. It's just not possible. But Paul was sent to declare who God is. And he said it in plain words. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. I couldn't help but think of a quote that I read once. And so I looked into it, and uh, two authors were going back and forth. And William Faulkner is talking about Ernest Hemingway, and he says, he has never known to use a word that might send a reader to the dictionary. Now, you would think that would be criticism, but that makes me want to read him even more. Because I've bought in books that is a struggle to get through. They are doing a great job collecting dust in my bookcase because I don't want to read them. There's great information in it. I'll give you an example. Robert Outler's, I think it's study on idioms or something along that line. There's amazing information in it. But I have to like crack open a second book to understand what he's saying half the time. Just tell me plain English. You know, I, I skip the warning, don't do this. Let's, how do I start? When I open up a thing from, like, uh, Home Depot, I want the quick start instructions. I don't want to read the 65 pages how electricity is bad and wants to kill me. I know that. Just get me where I need to go. And I love Hemingway's response. He goes, poor Faulkner. Does he really think big emotions come from big words? He thinks I don't know the $10 words. I know them all right, but there are older and simpler and better words, and those are the ones I use. The ability to speak plain English. We don't have to use grandress. I can't even say them, sorry. You don't, have to, you don't have to have an amazing vocabulary to understand God is more than good. Amen. What do we teach our kids? How many gods are there? And what's his name? Do we need anything further to compound that, or does that convey the message? It conveys it. We don't have to overly complicate it. We don't have to upsell it. Speaking of $10 words, I found a list and I took my three favorites. First, smithereens. Because I love saying that. I'm just going to smash it to smithereens. What, Dad? Oh, small pieces. Okay. 
These other ones I don't use often, but I just find them enjoyable. Hornswoggle. To deceive someone. And this one, snollygoster. One who is guided by personal advantage and not by principles. I, I enjoy those because they're fun. But don't expect me to carry on a conversation like that. I'm sure Paul had the ability to use as many $10 words as there is. He was schooled in all manner of things. However, he was not going to overcomplicate the message of truth. This was out of the ordinary, especially for Corinth, which would have been so heavily influenced by Greek culture, where it was less about what you were arguing about and more about how do you present your argument. It makes me think of a high school debate team. Pick a side. Does it matter what side? No, it's all about the argument. Why are we arguing if it doesn't matter? Why is there even a discussion? If there's nothing to be said, I'm fine sitting there in silence. But this would have been out of the ordinary, completely out of the ordinary for that time period. The center of philosophy was well, Athens, I believe at the time was a lot of it. And Corinth was between Athens and Sparta, about halfway in Greece. So it wasn't far removed. So they would have had heavily influence. But Paul wasn't going to put on an act. Because it's easy to put on an act and put on a demonstration and lose the truth. To get so caught up in a delivery that the message is lost. To quote Brother Wright from his notes on 1 Corinthians, God's power cannot be faked. Anointing can be faked. Loud preaching can be substituted. Gymnastics can be employed. Fast speaking sometimes is mistaken for powerful preaching. Now, if I start going, ha, ah, after everything... One, you guys aren't going to know what to do and wonder if you give me a cough drop. But I can mistake a lot of things and make a lot of things rhyme, but it doesn't make any sense. We can get all jacked up on emotion. We can trigger responses. We can learn how to preach and how to get a reaction. But if it is empty and void of a true message, it is worthless, it is a waste of time, and it is a detriment to the body because it distracts from the truth of who he is. And I hit my iPad, so I'm way off in my notes. Yep, that's, that's a negative. And Paul says that from his text that there's two effects. It's either foolishness or it is the power of God to salvation. Does speaking the truth is sorry, is speaking the truth foolishness? No. No. Is the truth the power of God? So what is the difference between foolishness and power? It is the person that's listening. Because if the preacher is preaching the truth, it can still be foolishness to them who don't believe. But to those who believe, it is the power of God unto salvation. It becomes of no effect to them who do not listen. It makes no sense. It doesn't mean anything to them. It becomes foolishness. It becomes Charlie Brown's teacher. Wah, 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 wah. How was church? Wah, 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 wah. It is not the preacher. It is because of the truth, and God moves on the hearts 
and minds of those who are looking to him. Romans 1.20. I know, a shock, I'm going to Romans. <laughs> For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. In Romans 1, we see where those who refuse to worship him as God live for their own lusts and then vile affections and then are given to a normal mind to do that which is shameful, whose thinking is so perverse and far from God that they create their own wisdom to justify their actions and attempt to reduce God to a creation in an attempt to become their own gods, their own wisdom. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of the world? Where are these people when God's wisdom is revealed? There's not too many people fighting when he says, I am God and reveals himself. If I remember correctly, it's every knee and tongue shall, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess, every. So those who are wise, the scribes, the disputers of the world, are they going to be able to confront and say, nope, nope, this is the wisdom? They hide behind the grace of God and say it's not true. God hath made the wisdom of this world foolish. Where is the created that thinks it is wiser than the true living king? For all of man's wisdom, they can never know God. All of man's wisdom, science, can never know God. There is a limitation upon man's ability to think and to understand. It is capped. And our own wisdom comes falls short because he is beyond our understanding. It is only by him reaching down and reveal himself that we have the opportunity to see him. They are not capable. But it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Here's my personal take on the foolishness of preaching. When you see more of him, It is foolishness to think that man can ever express how glorious he truly is. Man does not have the words complicated or simple to ever express how truly magnificent his grace is to us. It is foolishness that we even attempt to express it. But he says, express it. And that makes it worth doing. It is foolishness to think that grace sets us better than anyone else. Paul continues, the Jews seek a sign. Well, well, yeah, they grew up with the histories, the pillar of fire, and the great deliverance, and water from the rock, and making it through the desert. Why wouldn't they seek a sign? That's what they've been told their entire life. There's a sign, there's a sign, there's a sign. And the truth is a stumbling block. And for the Greek, they want wisdom. They absolutely want wisdom. I don't need any understanding. I just want more tools to argue effectively. And when you tell me it, mm, because it doesn't have a work in me, it's foolishness. And Paul then emphasized the true separation of our understanding from God. God's foolishness is so far beyond the wisdom of man. And his weakness is so far beyond our strongest. It is not our flesh that draws us to him, 
We have not earned it and never will. But God hath chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of this world to confine them which are mighty. And base things of this world and the things that are despised hath God chosen, yea, and the things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. Why? Why choose the base things? Why choose the simplest things? Well, it's easy to understand, but why? Why pick the weakest things? Why not take the Nobel Prize winner? Why not take the scientist that's making groundbreaking cures? Why not take the Olympian who's, you know, the peak of physical ability for whatever that sport is? Why not the best of the best? Why not take the good things? Why not take those who have earned their place in our society? That no flesh should glory in his presence. Because if it was our ability, we would lose focus of him. We would think it was us. We would think that we could earn it. You could think that there's something we could do to ever demand of God salvation he has provided. Because if we think we've earned it, then I have a right to it. If I go to work and they don't have my paycheck, I earn that. I'm demanding that. I'm going to sit on the counter until I see that it cleared because I worked for it. I demand it. It's earned. You don't demand a gift. No. Maybe once when I was a kid, I think I still have the hand marks where my mom caught me. (laughs) But our flesh would glory in it. And we would think that we're better than others. We would think that we are deserving. And we would lose sight that it's him and not us. But of him is verse 30, that revolving door word. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Our glory needs to be in him, not our actions. Our righteousness is filthy rags. Plainly put, Paul's speaking here, all of it was, I'm speaking plain English so you understand what I'm saying. I'm trying to use as little words as possible to convey the message to you so that you don't think it's of me. I don't want you going around saying, I'm of Paul. I want you to go around saying, I've seen the truth and I am the Lord Jesus Christ. It is Him. It is the knowledge of Him that enriches us. And it is His grace Paul absolutely could have made a spectacle of the truth. He could have absolutely got up there and made speeches, used all the fancy $10 words that there are, but that would have taken away from the message of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is Him. About three years ago, there was a store that sprung up in Los Angeles. The, sh- the store showcased luxury shoes by the Italian designer Bruno Palessi. It was a massive hit. The store was only open 10 days. They had, fans- they had a red carpet event. They had fashionistas. They had influencers. They had all these fancy folk. And a real who's who event to showcase how nice these luxury shoes are, how fancy they are. And it was a huge success. People were in there saying how wonderful it was. According to the Washington Post, Palessi is such high quality, high fashion, taking your shoe game up to the next level. It looks really well made. Another person says, it's just stunning, elegant, sophisticated, versatile. For me to experience this as an Italian designer is amazing. Spent four, five hundred dollars on pairs of shoes. The problem is, 
There's no Bruno Pelesi. Instead, it was a social experiment ad campaign by Payless Shoe Stores. This is, this is a true story. They set up in a former high-end Santa Monica building. They even had gold-painted statues of lions and giraffes brought in. They left all the existing glass furniture. They had all glass shelves. They put some of their shoes as high as $1,800. People were buying them for two, four, six hundred dollars a piece. And what they would do is they would record them, and then they would take them to a back room, give them back their money, and say, well, thank you for buying Payless's 1999 shoes. <laughs> these are the same people bragging about how good these are. Wonderful. These are amazing, well-made. The egg on the face of snubbing Payless, but then spending $600 for it. So why that story, Phil? I know it's short, but please stand, and I'll go into my closing, and I'll tell you why that story. People love getting excited about stuff that makes them belong. People love getting excited about new things. But when facts and reality are different, you lose some credibility. Those people who had egg on their face... I'm sure they boycott pay less to this day. <laughs> you don't need to upsell God. Right. You don't need to upsell God. You just tell them the truth. Amen. Like Paul said, his weakness is beyond man's strength and his foolishness is beyond man's wisdom. I want you to follow along as I draw a parallel here. Our lives are seen, are they not? Our actions are seen by others, whether it's our household, our people out there, our friends, our families. Do they not see our lives? We've often talked a big game, and reality is different, isn't it? My plans are, oh, I'm going to get that Mustang, I'm going to fix it up, and I may have got the Mustang, and it's been in the garage for 14 years, but hey, you know what? I'm going to get it done. You know, little things. Oh, yeah, we're going to do ham. Oh, they're, make, they're baking a ham. Oh, I never said we're baking ham. We're making ham sandwiches. I just got back from the deli. <laughs> <laughs> little things like that, but the truth is our words and our actions don't always coincide. Our actions reveal more about who we are than what comes out of our mouths. And that doesn't give us excuse to not govern our mouths because our mouths also speak what's in our heart. But here's the parallel. Our lives are our preaching. The way we act, the way we behave, the way we interact with others, the way we respond to events, that is our preaching to everyone. I'm not called to preach. Every one of us, by our actions, preaches who the Lord Jesus Christ is. To those who don't believe, it is foolishness. You go to church how often? You go to church where? You do what? Why? But to those who believe, it is the power of God. You don't need $10 words to describe who he is. You don't need fancy speak to tell others about who God is. You just tell them what he's done for you. And if you don't realize what he's done for you, look around. Look around. We have been blessed abundantly. The goodness that he has bestowed upon our lives Tell them, he is enough. Pastor, will you pray a closing for us?